do this recording now. Audio is not on, so it didn't give me the warning. Um, so basically, our, our main reactions or either benzylic reactions, which behave a lot like, like allylic reactions. So there wasn't really anything new with the benzylic reactions. Um, and then there was that Birch reduction. And aside from those, there really is not a whole lot going on benzene wise. Um, so these were the, the quiz questions. And we went through the first one at least a little bit. So a reminder that, um, so NBS is that n bromosuccinamide. So that's the one that will preferentially um, brominate at the benzylic carbon or an allylic carbon. So a place where you've got resonance um, for the free radical intermediate that you wind up making. And then the um, second step, so you're gonna brominate the benzylic carbon. The second step, strong base, weak nucleophile. So T TBOK or TBOK is gonna be our, you know, our number one reagent that we use when we want to force an elimination and favor that over a substitution. So if we did, if the second step was hydroxide, now we're in strong base, strong nucleophile territory, and we have to look at other conditions or we're going to get a mixture of substitution products and elimination products. If we wanted to force it elimination, we use TBOC. And then I don't think we really looked we didn't come back to finish this one, but we did a bunch of practice with birch reactions. And so under that our rule here was we wanted, we want to make sure that the electron donating reagents stay on a pi bond, electron withdrawing agents, which are, which are any substituents that have pi bonds conjugated with the benzene ring. That's, that's your go-to um differentiation between the two um if it's electron donating it stays on a pi bond if it's electron withdrawing it wants to be on the sp3 carbons so all four of these are electron donating so they all want to be on a pi bond so if we consider our three possibilities remember this birch reduction we're making a ring structure where you have um, you break up the benzene to make uh, two sp3 carbons on opposite sides of the ring from each other. And again, if you're not sure how to how to best satisfy as many of these as possible, um, try drawing all three possibilities. Keep your substituents in the same spot. Draw the ring structure three times with your sp3 carbons in all three possible positions, and see which one best fits. The criteria. In, in this case, the third one is going to wind up looking exactly like the second one. So two and three, we can satisfy, we're satisfying half of our substituents, but the other half are not where they're supposed to be, versus Isomer one makes everything happy. And so, and again, today with electrophilic aromatic substitution, we're going to be dealing a lot with electron donating and electron withdrawing groups. That's basically the number one thing that determines where we're putting our new substituents. Um, so we're going to keep coming back to this idea of electron donating, electron withdrawing. Because it, it winds up making a big difference with these mechanisms. For that question, I don't think it was just um, like what's the product. It actually said draw the mechanism. Oh, okay. So then the mechanism for this one, I, and that was one that I wanted to go over anyway, um, given that it is kind of a tricky mechanism. Zoom out. So Remember that this is kind of a weird free radical mechanism. So once you know what your 
isomer is you're going to be making, that's going to determine where you draw your first step of the mechanism. Because the first thing that happens is sodium acts as a single electron donor. So sodium, and, and it's going to donate electrons to one of the two carbons that winds up being an sp3 carbon. So it doesn't matter which one, but one of these top and bottom carbons is going to get a single electron donated to it. And to make room for that, you basically have to have a series of reactions. You're going to wind up with a free radical on one side of the mechanism, on one side of the ring, and on the exact opposite side of the ring, you wind up with a lone pair with a, a carbon ion. So that, so that step would look like Remember when we're doing these single electron transfers, we've got to be using the, the fish hook arrows. And on this touch screen, it's a little hard to draw, but you wind up, so you wind up with two fish hook arrows meeting together to make um, our what's going to be our lone pair on the, the upper side of this ring structure, two Fischer arrows coming together to make our new pi bond right on the right hand side of the ring. And then on the bottom, do a Fischer arrow for an electron that's just gonna wind up by itself. So the result of all those single electron transfers is gonna be that after one step, wind up with a lone pair at the top. So that's, and, and remember a carbon with a lone pair is always gonna have a negative charge. And we wind up with a single electron by itself, free radical at the bottom. Again, it doesn't matter which way you draw these, which with whichever carbon the sodium donates its electron to, it's gonna be the one that has the lone pair first. And then from there, when you have a carbon with the negative charge, the next step is just to give the carbon four bonds. The carbon is an even better base. So remember, oxygen with a negative charge is a pretty good base. It's a strong base. Nitrogen with a negative charge is an even better base. Carbon with a negative charge continues that trend. It is even stronger base than, than a nitrogen. So the fact that we've got a carbon ion here means Next thing we want to do is we want to protonate that. And so that's where the methanol comes in. It's just a proton source. So we wind up with, and the only reason why we don't just do this entire, the only reason that ammonia is even involved here is, is if we just use methanol as our solvent, we wind up with the sodium reducing the methanol instead of reducing the benzene ring. You need the methanol to be there just enough to give a ready proton source, but at a low enough concentration that it's not going to easily react with your sodium metal. So the, the fact that the ammonia is a much worse acid than methanol is why we use the, the ammonia as our um, as our solvent in this case. Um, based on this first, I guess let's draw the next step first. So then we've got methanol around, just a quick proton transfer, the lone pair grabs hydrogen. Now we're using full arrows, not fish hook arrows. A whole pair of electrons. So our intermediate here our substituents here.
It's going to look like this. So produced one of the carbons, then protonated it. The other carbon has not been reduced yet. It's still a free radical, but it's we know what where it's going to go or what is going to happen next. We need to get another single electron somehow. Um, but before we draw that, why wouldn't we want to use a an aprotic solvent instead of using ammonia? Ammonia is not a convenient solvent, right? It boils below freezing, so you have to do this. You have to do this at dry ice temperatures to use ammonia as a solvent. Why would we do that instead of just using, say, something like acetone? Yeah, probably. So there's there's two likely reasons that it's advantageous to use ammonia. One is we need something that's polar enough that it can stabilize this negatively charged intermediate, and plus we also wound up making a a byproduct of methoxy methoxide. Um, so we wind up with something that is not super stable. And actually after our, our byproduct after step one was a sodium ion too, right? So we need something that'll stabilize these negative and positive charges enough that we can actually get this reaction to happen at a reasonable rate. And so a polar product solvent is might work for that, but it's not great. The more polar of a solvent you can use, the more you can stabilize those. Um, and the other side of this is that most aprotic solvents are going to be capable of being reduced, usually easier than benzene. You did this in acetone, you wind up with the sodium metal reducing the, the carbonyl carbon instead of reducing the benzene carbon. So we need something where you can't reduce it anymore. You can't reduce um, ammonia other than just deprotonating it, and that's not even really a reduction. That's because the, the ammonia still has control all the same number of electrons. So, because most polar aprotic solvents are going to interfere and cause a side reaction, we can't use those, and we want to stabilize these charged products and intermediates as much as possible. All right, so let me clean this up a little bit so we can do the last steps. Um, the second two steps are the same as the first two steps, except now we already have a free radical instead of making a free radical. And so we just have another ammonia, or sorry, another sodium. Ion, or not ion, sodium um, atom. coming in to act as a, an electron donor, single electron donor. And now we wound up making another charged intermediate. And with the carbon ions, you don't necessarily have to draw the lone pair and the charge. You see a carbon with a lone pair, it's implied that it has a lone pair, um, but it's not a bad habit to be in because this is really the only time we wind up um, with carbon with a lone pair is when it has a negative charge. So just to make sure you don't you know, um, mix things up, it's not a bad idea to draw them both. And then we just do another proton transfer. So, so Again, same two steps. Sodium acts as a single electron donor, followed by a proton transfer. Touch screens are great as long as there's nothing else that can act as a, a conductor. 
my cat's burp sets off my touch screen on my tablet sometimes because it you know, builds up static charge up here at altitude. Or it can get in. So then. That's our last step. So we need to we wind up needing a two to one stoichiometric ratio for the sodium metal and for the um, proton source. And really probably overdo it a little bit on the proton source because you need it, the proton transfer steps to happen relatively quickly. Um, it's a little unusual to me that you don't just use use an acid, I guess, maybe you want to slow down the reaction to some extent, kind of finding that sweet spot between the reaction happening too quickly. Um, because a lot of times in organic chemistry, we just see like, you know, add a drop of sulfuric acid as your catalyst to start this. Um, but I guess you can't do it just as a catalyst because it is being used up in a stoichiometric ratio. But it seems like you could just acidify the ammonia and that would work, but it might work too well in that case. Right, you, you wind it with ammonia using acting as your as your proton source. Um, but my guess is that that the common acids that you might use to do that, if you wanted to do it in a stoichiometric amount, that might be uh, some other side reaction as well, um, because chloride could act as a nucleophile potentially to throw things off. Um, sulfate, sulfate, the sulfur could wind up being reduced. That might be easier than reducing the benzene to make sulfite. So, I mean, and the reason that they give us these specific conditions is generally because somebody has gone through, tried a bunch of things once they figured out the mechanism. And this is what's commonly accepted as the easiest with the best yield. Um, oh, it's, it is kind of fun to poke at, like, well, what if we did it this other way? That's kind of how synthetic chemistry happens, how you get things, you know, how you find new mechanisms or new um, conditions not new mechanisms, it's sort of by looking mechanism. Well, what would it that way? Um, this would be actually a good candidate to do a project like that in this class, other than the fact you have to do everything at, at uh, dry ice temperatures, the ammonia, ammonia is not easy to work with. You're not set up for it. Right. Yeah, you, you can. We would have to be doing that, and we'd still probably get complaints because you know people are good at smelling ammonia. Um, you know, luckily, it's not too bad of a smell, not too unfamiliar of a smell, but still, we probably wind up with construction crew filming. Why? Why does it smell like somebody's been cleaning outside? So, um, kind of, mm -hmm. I think what I saw was. Yes. So that's that's the theory as well for what happens when you put sodium metal in water. Um, it, it's not just so the, the common explanation for what happens when you put sodium metal in water, which was the demonstration that Ricky was talking about, where we where we wound up causing explosions and fume hoods and splattering the inside of the glass screens. <laughs> um, the, uh, the common understanding of that used to be that it reduces the hydrogen on water, generates hydrogen gas, and when it happens to give off enough energy, um, then you wind up with the, the hydrogen gas igniting because it's exothermic enough that it just catches on fire in the presence of oxygen. Um, but there was a group who did a really cool study where they said, well, so what happens if we do it without oxygen in the environment? In that case, it shouldn't explode because if it's the hydrogen gas that's causing the explosion, 
and they found out it still exploded. Um, and the, the reason that it did that was basically that when you, it, the sodium metal, if you think of the sodium metal as just being a collection of atoms that are trying to give away electrons as fast as possible to the water, you wind up giving the electrons away so fast that the entire surface of this particle winds up covered in positive charges. But the electrons had not, had not produced enough hydroxide ions yet to actually counteract that. So you wound up with this really localized um, concentration of positive charges that push each other away really, really fast. And sodium metal is a soft enough metal and it melts at low enough temperatures that it actually deforms the surface of the sodium metal. And you get something that looks like one of those cartoons of, of coronavirus, where you wind up with this, you know, shape like this, except, and that puts, you know, spreads out the positive charges. But the problem with that is now you just made a whole bunch more surface area for the sodium metal, which then reacts with the water more. So it's a, it's a reaction that, that um, feeds itself. It's a self-catalyzing reaction. Autocatalytic, that's the word. An autocatalytic reaction, once it starts, it, it is its own catalyst and speeds itself up and you get a runaway reaction. It just results in this whole thing splattering apart. Um, and they, so they did this, they did this real, really cool setup where they found a mixture of sodium, an alloy of sodium metal and potassium metal reacted the fastest without going to something like cesium. And they, they made a ball of it and they dropped it up from high enough that it went under the surface of the water and they did it under an inert gas, under nitrogen gas, I wanna say. And then they filmed what happened with the high speed camera. Um, and they, you can actually see it. Like you, there's like this flash of purple around the outside, and then you see it form like these spikes. Um, and, then, and then it just disappears. And the purple is actually solvated electrons. When you put elect, when you have so many electrons being given away so quickly that the water can't even accept them fast enough, you get this like purple light color that happens. What's, uh, what in the unit looks once there's enough electrons in solution, it looks like a lovely liquid copper. Oh, okay. It suddenly turns into like looking like water into looking like copper. So that could certainly be a, playing a role with the dissolving metal reactions too then as well. Uh, I hadn't thought about I've thought about that, but basically it would be the sodium really acting as the electron donor. That's the like the net result. But the actual process might just be the, you know a case where you actually have a free electron floating around effectively. Um, and that's why the benzene happens to um, actually get reduced in this case. And if there's anything else that could be reduced, that gets reduced instead. So we keep it only other molecules that can't be reduced around. Let's see, I have another practice qualitative analysis. We want to do another practice of these. Um, are we feeling pretty good about NMRIR right now? We'll save it for the end. We'll see if we have time at the end. At the very least, this one doesn't look like it's going to be too tricky because it only has one oxygen and we know it's an alcohol. And we know that we've got a mono substituted benzene. Those two things right there give us a pretty good indication of what's going on. Um, and limit, and then it's just a matter of well, what do we do with the other nine or the other three carbons? Where is that OH group exactly? Again, getting fluent in spectroscopy is a really powerful thing because you start to see those patterns and it doesn't take very long to pick up on the biggest pieces. All right. So when we're looking at benzenes, we have already established this, right? Benzene doesn't go through the same addition reactions 
um, that other alkenes go through, which is why it gets its entire own classification. Aromatic is not the same as an alkene. It gets its own several chapters in the textbook because it behaves so differently. Um, so with that in mind, we don't actually wind up with, so this would be an electrophilic addition reaction normally. When you have something that wants electrons, it'll seek out an alkene and you'll wind up with those, with our electron hungry, um, our electrophiles, basically stealing the electrons from the two carbons and you wind up with it being an oxidation, generally speaking. Um, with benzene, we don't get electrophilic addition, we get electrophilic substitution. So it's a totally opposite mechanism as nucleophilic substitution, where it was just a matter of push this off, here comes our new pair of electrons, and we've got a new molecule. With electrophilic substitution, um, things look a little bit different. So they first realized that there was something weird going on when they, when they tried to add bromine to benzene, nothing happens. And then they did it, I wanna say they did it with some contaminated samples. They had some iron present for some reason. Maybe they even tried to scale up a reaction um, in an iron vessel or something like that. Um, when you do this in the presence of iron, you don't wind up with an addition reaction. You wind up replacing a hydrogen with, a, with our new electrophile. So the, the biggest difference in terms of the net reaction is that with nucleophilic substitution, we're replacing a good leaving group, right? And, with a, and a good leaving group is generally something with, that's electron withdrawing or at the very least something that's, that's really electronegative. With electrophilic substitution, you're replacing a hydrogen with our electrophile. So it basically goes the opposite end of the spectrum. Instead of replacing something that's electronegative with something that's equally electronegative or more electronegative, we wind up replacing a hydrogen, the least electronegative thing present with our electrophile. And so we need something that's quote unquote hungry for electrons, something that's a good oxidizing agent in order to do this. So bromine gas on its, or bromine on its own is not strong enough to do this, but when you add iron to it, you can make bromine a good enough electrophile. Um, and you still don't get great yields, all things considered. 75% is, I mean, it's better than some of the reactions we deal with, but it's not like this is a highly favored reaction. Um, so what is the iron doing, likely? Good, yeah, and then that's, uh, it must be doing to some, something to lower the activation energy, right? Because that's what makes it happen. What is iron? So we've seen iron before um, in the form of when we had um, let's see FeBr3 was a substituent that made the bromine a better nucleophile, right? So we could actually have an SN2 reaction happening where bromine would replace an OH group if we had iron three bromide just bromine gas or hydrobromic acid on its own was not enough to do that. Does anybody remember what that did? What we called that? Lewis acid. Yeah. So a lot of times, especially, um, and a lot of times with these metals, we wind up with them being a surface cat based catalyst. Um, but a lot of times with iron specifically, it's not necessarily what's happening at the surface. It's that you wind up making a complex like this. And that gives the bromine more a stronger um, electrophilic urge because you wind up with the making a, 
complex that looks like It looks like this. So now I've got a bromine with a positive charge here because it's got too many electrons. And in, in the other reaction, this had the result of making the, brom the bromine at the end a stronger partial negative so that it could act as a better nucleophile. In this case, though, we can wind up with the other bromine being made a stronger electrophile because it's got a positive charge. So basically it makes it less stable. We destabilize the bromine even further to make it more reactive. Um, and so we're gonna actually go through a, a series of reactions that all have the same mechanism. So just like with nucleophilic substitution, um, electrophilic substitution has a variety of things we can use as the electrophile, depending on on what product we want. Um, and they're all going to go through the same basic steps. Um, and again, as a reminder, we're replacing a hydrogen on the, on the benzene ring, not anything else. Once you put something else on a benzene ring, you can't go through electrophilic substitution anymore. It'll go through some other classification uh, reactions. Um, or sorry, one day we'll replace one of the other hydrogen instead of replacing something that's already been put there. And so it's only the hydrogens that go through this. So when we were looking at halogenation back in chapter eight, we first looked at addition, it was acting as an electrophile as well. Um, and we wind up making that bromonium ion. And then we had the bromide acting as the second, as a nucleophile in step two. So the first step, was an electrophilic attack by the bromine. The second step was a nucleophilic attack by the bromide. And in this case, we, we wind up making something with the iron, we wind up making that similar complex, um, but you wind up with the net result of making a bromide not a better nucleophile, but a better electrophile. And so remember that Lewis acids, when you see a metal, especially metal dissolved, a metal ion in the organic chemistry, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be acting as a Lewis acid, which means it's an electron acceptor. So the way that I keep the definitions for, for Lewis acids and bases straight is I remember that everything is exactly opposite as Bronsted-Lowry. Bronsted-Lowry with acids are when we're talking about proton donor, proton acceptor. That's what we're used to thinking about for acids. For Lewis acids, it's not the proton, it's the electron. And it's not the donor, it's the acceptor. And so it's basically, it's like a double negative. A Bronsted-Lowry acid is a proton donor, so a Lewis acid is an electron acceptor. Because you switch to the charge, you also switch whether it's donator or acceptor. And so our overall mechanism is once we have that, that Lewis acid complex, we wind up basically breaking one of the five bonds. So it's actually really similar to the bromonium addition. We don't make that, that three-sided ring. We wind up basically breaking open the benzene ring and adding bromide to one of the carbons. But that leaves a carbocation where from the carbon that lost its its pi bonds, which this can then resonate. So we can actually, this is stable enough because it has three different resonance structure. And this these resonance structures collectively are known as the sigma complex. Right? And so that sigma complex is you've broken the benzene ring. And now you've got that positive charge, that vacant spot resonating around your benzene ring. What was your benzene ring? Um, but because we know that benzene is so much more stable when it's aromatic, the next step is basically reform the benzene ring. 
broke open the benzene ring the sigma complex, the next step is, well, we need a pair of electrons somewhere so we can make this benzene ring again. And so the way that happens is it's just a proton transfer step. So we break open the benzene ring, make a sigma complex, and then from the same carbon that got the bromine added, because that's the only carbon that's sp3. And so if, if we can get rid of that proton, we can go back to all of our carbons being sp2, and we can reform the aromatic ring. And so you just wind up with basically the, the um, bromide that's still attached to the iron, perhaps the hydrogen, the electrons that were in the carbon hydrogen bond move to one of the, to either of these two resonance structures, to one of the vacant spots, uh, or to the only vacant spot. And then you reform your benzene ring and you've effectively just kicked off a hydrogen and replaced it with a bromine. Right, so it's a, it's a two-step reaction. Or, so the mechanism is actually not that bad. This is kind of a lot of writing to draw the sigma complex. Um, and you should draw the sigma complex just to show that those three resonance structures are all happening because it'll play a, a big role in determining where we put our substituent when we have, when we already have something on our benzene ring. If we have a substituent on our benzene ring already, depending on whether it's electron donating or electron withdrawing, that'll change where we're going to make our substitution. Because this sigma complex that wrote that sends a positive charge around the ring is going to preferentially want to form in a way that lets your positive charge be next to electron donating groups, not electron withdrawing groups. So basically, when you're picking which hydrogen to pull off, it depends on what's already there because of the sigma complex and the way that it rotates that positive charge to three different spots. Um, and so you might expect, since it's a similar mechanism to our addition reactions, that we might get some addition product, but because you lose the aromaticity, it's so unfavorable um, that, that effectively speaking, you get no addition product, uh, which simplifies things, right? Basically means like, you know, we've considered that there might be a competing reaction and basically tossed it out the window um, because it would be so unfavorable to do that. Which is nice. Anytime we can say we don't need to worry about a competing reaction, that simplifies things a lot, right? So let's let's have you do a practice, draw the mechanism yourself for chlorination, where it has an aluminum chloride acting as the Lewis base or Lewis acid instead of iron bromide. Same exact process though. So give this a go. Um, it is not because that was with free radical mechanisms. So because we're basically directing it, the reason we don't use iron chloride is because we might see that happening. It might be too good of a Lewis acid. So we use aluminum, which is not as strong as Lewis acid.
All right. I drew out some of these structures, but we'll go through and add the arrows in real time here. So first step is drawing out your Lewis acid complex, right? Which is always going to look like your metal ion forming a bond with what's going to become your electrophile. So you wind up making something that's not very stable. As a result, you can wind up with the chlorine that has the two bonds, keeps the pair of electrons from the chlorine chlorine bonds, and the chlorine that's at the end steals the electrons from the benzene. So that means you're going to wind up making that sigma complex where you've got, and it doesn't matter which hydrogen you picked in this case, they're all equivalent. So I picked the one that was drawn in a convenient location based on where I had white space on the slide. But the net result is that other side, wherever you add your chlorine, carbon on the other side of that pi bond is missing a pair of electrons now. And so you wind up with three resonance structures. And remember to draw your resonance arrows properly. They're not equilibrium arrows. You do need to show that they're double-sided arrows. Here, if you don't show them as double-sided arrows, that's wrong actually, because it's not like it's an irreversible set. It's just a resonance structure. So we very specifically want to show all of these are happening at the same time. And then your last step is just going to be reforming the benzene ring. So you're going to have that the other chlorine from our Lewis acid uh, complex, the one that get, got to keep the electrons, or it doesn't really matter which chlorine, but one of the chlorines that's still attached to the aluminum is going to take a pair of electrons. And grab that hydrogen, which leaves the the carbon hydrogen electrons free to move over into the carbocation. And then as a net result, we reform our um, benzene ring, our aromatic structure. And then technically this is plus HCl. So this is one good indication of how a Lewis acid can make a solution more acidic without actually having any protons to give itself. Lewis acids make solutions more acidic by making other things more likely to give up an H plus. So in the case of water, it's because it forms a strong attractive bond between the oxygen and the water, which makes it easier to pull off the protons from a water. But in other solutions, you saw the same net result of making the solution more acidic, um, despite the fact that the aluminum chloride doesn't have any protons of its own to bring to the table. All right, so questions on these on this one. And so let's just talk about the general mechanism before we take a break for today. Our general mechanism is you've got an electrophile. Electrophile steals a pair of electrons to make an sp3 carbon and three resonance structures. So you, that sigma complex is the key. If you get the hang of drawing the sigma complex, then all of these mechanisms are the same. The only way they differ is sometimes in how do we make our electrophiles. Electrophiles in general are not super stable. 
So electrophile attacks make the sigma complex, proton transfer to remake the benzene. Same, same three, two steps, but you've got to throw in the sigma complex as a step. It's the same three steps every time. Reaction happens again. Added like um, it can. It can. It depends on what you add it to some extent and what your stoichiometry is. Because if you add an electron withdrawing group, um, then that actually slows the reaction down. Because remember, the first step is, and the, which is the slowest step, is um, break up the benzene ring. By stealing some electrons, right? If you decrease the electron density in the benzene ring, that's going to make it harder to do that, right? So it gets, depending on what we're adding as our as our electrophile, successive reactions get harder and slower. So sometimes, so there's a limit to whether or not you can just keep going indefinitely based on the electron density and how strong the electron withdrawing groups are. And it's the halogens, it's, I, I know I told you to use the conjugated pi bonds as whether it's electron donating or electron withdrawing. The only place that rule breaks down is halogens are electron withdrawing because they're electronegative um, and not the same size as the benzene ring. Because so oxygen with a lone pair can still be electron donating because the oxygen is the same, the oxygen orbitals are in the same energy level. So the oxygen orbitals are close enough to the same size as the benzene pi electrons. That oxygens and nitrogens, despite being electronegative, are still electron donating. But the halogens are electron withdrawing because they're like electronegative and they don't have orbitals that are the same size. So doing this reaction twice in a row, the second one, you have less electron density in the middle here. And so it's gonna go slower if at all. And that is absolutely, once we go through these, these mechanisms, that's the next step is, well, what happens when something's already there? How does that affect things? And that's where electron donating and withdrawing is gonna play a big role. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at, I'm trying to decide. Let's come back at five after. Um, and I promise I'll remember to go through and take off any questions that we don't get to this time. So you don't get questions on the quiz that we haven't covered yet.
One of the one of the women who works in the instruction office wrote that on the, the board in there for me. I had seen it before, but that is a good one. <laughs> Just talking now, I would consider using my half hour break between now and uh, office hours to go get donuts or something. But you Everybody knows the cardinal rules of, of bringing food to class. Right? 
don't let your food make you late because that looks really bad when you walk in with a bag from McDonald's or something and you're five minutes late. Because it's very clear that you chose to go get McDonald's instead of making it to class on time. And don't bring loud food. Crinkly chip bag. And then like you know, you know how loud chips are when you're trying to eat it. It's just not not good. You no know, smell smells are not good either, but you know, coffee is permissible. Coffee is permissible. No tuna. No tuna. <laughs> no tuna in the microwave. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy, Kathy Cox occasionally does that in our office. She, she not tuna usually. She microwaves Brussels sprouts, though. Uh, <laughs> that's awful. I love Brussels sprouts, so but good. the smell of it. There's a green green like curry, and then you I know there's <laughs> the prettiest eating. Back in which class there were no quiet facts. <laughs> also, you are going to have to make sure that you block at the same time as the teacher. Yeah. That helps, yeah. <laughs> Free enough to share. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it also helps when you're a good student. You get more leeway if you're a good student. If you're a student who's barely hanging on, um, not showing up for class half the time, and then you show up late with food, you're going to get called out by, <laughs> by the teacher. And somebody who's here all the time, does the work, eating quietly in the back, it's going to get a pass usually. All right. Let's talk about sulfonation. So sulfonation is... So we've got chlorination, bromination. We now have like five different mechanisms that we can call chlorination and bromination, right? So we kind of have to be specific. So we're talking about electrophilic substitution. Um, but there's really a sulfonation um, is not a common reaction other than with electrophilic aromatic substitution. Um, and it is pretty nasty. It's get pretty good yields with it. But you have to use fuming sulfuric acid, which fuming sulfuric acid is basically you take concentrated sulfuric acid and then you bubble sulfur trioxide through it. Um, so either one of those is really nasty on its own. And so then we're just going to go ahead and stick them together. Um, because what that does um, is it, it allows us to have, so if you just use sulfur trioxide and you put it in water, it'll actually act as a Lewis acid with the water to make sulfuric acid. So we have to do this in concentrated sulfuric acid, um, essentially so that if you do wind up with the, the sulfur trioxide acting as a Lewis acid, you just wind up making the same molecule that you started with. You wind up, it's, it's a lot like using ethoxide in ethanol, because then it doesn't matter if it acts as a base on the solvent molecule because you make the same molecule you started with. So this is actually our electrophile, is the sulfur trioxide. Um, and the sulfuric acid is just there to stabilize it. Um, and that, it works essentially, because despite the fact that sulfur and oxygen have both are electronegative, um, the sulfur has those larger energy levels. So you don't get as strong of a bond between the sulfur and the oxygen as you might otherwise. So just based on electronegativity, we wouldn't expect sulfur to be a very strong electrophile, but because it's one level down on the periodic table, it behaves in a much more electrophilic way. And in the steps, are the exact same here. All right, sulfur trioxide acts as a, it's a nucleophilic attack by the benzene electrons, where you could think of it as being the electrophile stealing electrons from the benzene. You make your sigma complex, do a proton transfer to so pull the hydrogen off of the sigma complex and reform your benzene ring. So this is our first product, 
but then if, we, if we're in, in such an acidic solution, it's not going to stay deprotonated. So we just wind up with two proton transfers in a row. Um, the first reforms the benzene ring. The second one just takes that SO3 group um, and protonates it. Ricky, you know if this one has a common name or is it just benzene sulfonic acid? Okay, so it behaves. Again, I'm going to go kind of quick through some of these because the, the interesting part is the variety of the electrophiles, not necessarily this mechanism. I guess we call it oxalic acid. Oxalic acid. So nitration. Again, same exact thing, except instead of using fuming sulfuric acid, we can use the fact that um, sulfuric acid is a stronger, or the nitric acid is a stronger acid than sulfuric acid. Um, so you can effectively, no, it is the other way around. Sulfuric acid is stronger than nitric acid. So the sulfuric acid will actually protonate the nitric acid. And so you wind up making, this is now our Lewis acid complex, is this weird looking protonated nitric acid, which I'll redraw that without the, without the arrows so you can see what it looks like. So nitric acid is just, That's nitric acid right there. If you protonate the same oxygen that already has a hydrogen, you wind up with a good leaving group. Especially because you because you've got two positive charges right next to each other. The nitrogen is sharing more than it wants to, and the oxygen just got protonated is sharing more than it wants to. So the the oxygen is protonated, leaves, takes the electrons with it. So you just have a quick dehydration and you wind up making this nitronium ion. Which is a good electrophile. Nitrogen with positive charge, nitrogen is pretty electronegative. So it's going to go out and find electrons. and make a sigma complex. So at the very least, we should be able to draw the sigma complex. If you're comfortable drawing the, the two steps on either side that are pretty similar to what we've seen before. Anybody know what the pKa is for the first proton on sulfuric acid? It's like negative 13 or something like that. It's, it's more, it's a stronger acid than hydroiodic acid. Um, I want to say it's negative double digits. Yes, 
which luckily does not happen too much with aromatic substitution um, because you're adding a nitro group, which is electron withdrawing, right? So it should follow that same feedback loop where when you add a nitro, nitro group, that slows down the reactivity of that molecule to further nitration, um, unless you are unless you put it in very very specific conditions, which is how you make trinitrotoluene. Though, um, so it's clearly possible. And clearly, the, uh, the synthesis of trinitrotoluene was a fairly big deal, especially back in the 1800s when it first happened. Does anybody know who first did that? The trinitrotoluene frequently abbreviated as TNT. I know you know. Yeah. He got himself the, the nickname the Merchant of Death um, as a result. So and he felt so bad about it that he founded the Nobel Prize. Catholic Jewish, right? Probably not, because he was Swedish. Okay. So likely Lutheran. He was uh, religious at all. If I'm just making broad stereotypes. <laughs> I was making a broad stereotype with the guilt thing. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you like lost? Yeah, and when he recovered, so sort of a near, near death experience, lost his brother, realized that most of the uses of TNT around the world were not for mining like he initially thought they would be, um, and were actually military, and then proceeded to, um, to found the Nobel organization, Nobel Prize organization. Again, far more productive than the Winchester Mystery House. <laughs> right, so under the right circumstances, we can also make carbon-based electrophiles. So making Grignard reagents may give us a carbon-based nucleophile. Um, friedel crafts alkylation and friedel crafts acylation give us carbon-based electrophiles. And they work essentially the same way as, as making the chlorine um, electrophile. Use AlCl3 in the case of the alkylation, actually in both cases. And that makes the chlorine a good enough leaving group that it can leave on its own to make a uh, carbocation. Downside to that is that it means that you have to deal with rearrangements again, right? Because carbocations can wind up going through rearrangements. And so you this is the friedel crafts alkylation is not a very specific reaction with that regard. Because if you happen to have a molecule like this, you try to go through friedel crafts alkylation, you're gonna wind up with that carbocation charge shifting over to the tertiary carbon and not attaching where you want it to. So what's more common is to go through the friedel crafts acylation, where you start from an acid chloride, so it looks like that, and aluminum trichloride. Um, because this acylium ion does not go through a rearrangement. It'll keep the positive charge on that carbon. And so you wind up with more stereospecificity. And so then you just need to find a way to reduce that carbon, or, you know, replace that, that carbonyl with something um, with hydrogens. 
which there are some reactions we'll talk about that allow us to convert a carbonyl and reduce it not just to the alcohol, but all the way to the hydride, um, all the way to the uh, fully reduced form. Okay, but the process is going to be pretty much the same. And again, the alkylation is really, it can be tricky because we get carbocation rearrangements and works with SP3 carbons. So you can't attach um, a, an alkene in the benzylic position. You can't um, add, it seems like that would be a favorable thing to be able to add resonance, but you can't make that positive charge on a carbon carbon double bond. Um, so as a result, you can't do either of these Reaction. So it can only be specifically alkyl groups, meaning all that your chlorine is on a saturated carbon, is on the next three carbon. You might notice too, our yield is pretty low here 66%. That's even lower than our bromination yield. And if you did have it with something that could rearrange, you're going to get even worse yields. It'll be 66% overall split between two possible things. So when all else fails, you have no other possible way to get to some synthesis target. You can do this, but your yields are going to be, you know, less than 50% probably. Um, here's the mechanism shown again for the real graphs acylation which again is higher yields, more common. It just means you have to add another step. You want to get rid of the carbonyl at the end to fully reduce it. But we do have reactions that do that. But again, electrophile, generate your electrophile. Electrophile attacks benzene ring, makes a sigma complex. Proton transfer to reform the benzene. So that's all that's on this slide deck. And I will add these other slides in a second. But I wanted, I, I know we kind of went fast. There's a fair bit of volume there. Um, but I wanted to look at the beginning of what happens when it's a substituted benzene. Since we've talked about that a little bit, um, and it's one of those things that's going to, that's going to take more practice than just the basic mechanism because getting the right Um, the right stereochemist, right isomer, sorry, I do two things at once, um, is tricky. I just saw this the other day too, so I threw that on there. Um, when you're not sure if it's a doublet of doublets or a doublet of triplets or a triplet of doublets, these are all real chemistry terms. Doublet of doublet of doublet of doublets is actually a real chemistry term you can get for splitting. But really, when you actually measure it yourself, you get something that looks like this more commonly. So it's just multiplet. I also saw in the same vein, um, I saw basically this same, same type of multiplet where you really can't distinguish anything. Um, somebody photoshopped um, Dr. Strange in the multiplet of madness. Um, and it was it was this and you know Benedict Cumberbatch screaming in terror, um, which is also appropriate. All right, so here is our practice for finishing these, or for all the different mechanisms that we looked at so far. Right, the mechanisms are the same for each one. It's just a matter of remembering. Right, okay, I'm not adding my entire SO4. I'm adding SO3. I'm adding a single chlorine. But if you can keep that straight, got an alkylation one there. 
we want to pay attention to. So that's a chlorine attached to a carbon. So we're not going to be adding the chlorine in this case, we're adding the carbon as our electrophile. Right. If you were actually trying to make toluene, there are much better ways um, of, of getting toluene. But this is one way that you can do that. And everything has to start somewhere, right? So you know, those those organic chemists in the 1800s didn't necessarily have access to all the same precursors um, or or fruit for that matter. So I had to go somewhere. And so really, and since all of these are starting from benzene, the only way that these can be made more complicated is if it's not just benzene you're starting with. It's a substituted benzene. That's the only real variable here. And so what happens if we start from a substituted benzene? Well, then it depends. Then the, that sigma complex, well, a couple things. One, we have three different positions we could add our nitro group. So if we have three different possibilities and we want to know which possibility is more likely, it can be helpful to draw the sigma complex. So in the figuring out which sigma complex is going to be more favorable, there's, there's shorter ways to do it than doing this, um, writing out three different sigma complexes. But for starters, we can, we can look at that and we'll wind up seeing that if we add, so the, and the, a reminder of the terms here, green is para, meaning on opposite end of the benzene ring. The blue position is meta. And the red position is ortho. Right, so just as our shorthand for, for saying where things are attaching. If it attaches in the ortho position, we wind up with a sigma complex I threw those wrong. I saw which showing up above. So if we add our nitro group here, We wind up with our sigma complex putting a positive charge right next to the um, methyl group, right? Right next to that electron donating group. So what do we know about carbocation stability? What's the most stable form of carbocation when it's attached to Primary, secondary, tertiary, tertiary, right? And this isn't just tertiary, it's tertiary with resonance. So this is actually a pretty stable sigma complex. And the other, the other two forms of that would look like we've seen before with the resonating around, which would put a positive charge here or here on the other ones, right? So basically, Wherever we add our, our electrophile in the ortho positions to our new electrophile and in the para position is where we put a positive charge. If we put our electrophile on the meta position in the blue position, 
we wind up with a case where stage three. Up, we wind up with a case where now when this resonates around, it can never be put on the same carpet that the methyl is on. Right? That the other two resonance structures would look like look like this or Or this. So all of these have a, still have that positive charge, but none of them get to put the positive charge where the metal is, where it could actually help stabilize things. So we don't actually wind up with any additional stabilization that way. So basically, the red position. is going to be more stable than the blue one. Now, you guys try for the pair up position. If we had the, N, the NO2 group in the pair up position, in the green position, what does the sigma complex look like? So initially, it would look like that. And first resonance structure looks like that. And third resonance structure looks like the far right. So is this one favorable or unfavorable? Favorable, because one of our resonance structures puts the positive charge right next to an electron donating group. So the red ones and the green ones, the ortho and the para positions, both allow us to put a positive charge next to that other group. The meta position does not. So the ortho and the para positions are a favorable place to have this substitution happen. And the meta position is not unfavorable. There's no not like it's there's an extra barrier but it's just not the sigma complex isn't additionally stabilized additionally stabilized it doesn't have additional stabilization right so the, the ortho if you have an electron donating group the ortho and the pair up positions are where you can expect to see that substitution happen. you won't see any substitution in the meta position Uh, 
So this is that. Is that influence like the not terribly? It's more about the fact that so ortho is more favored by yield, but it's not because it's because the barrier is lower, it's because there's two carbons that it could run into that give it the ortho product versus only one that gives it the pair up position. Um, because all three of these, these resonance structures are all happening simultaneously, right? And there's as long as there's one that puts the positive charge on a tertiary carbon, then that still gets the same level of stabilization as the other one. Because it's simultaneous, we don't need to worry about, well, it has to go through an extra step or when you're separating the two pi bonds, they're all still resonant. Just that one of those resonance structures is more stable than the others. Versus if it's in the meta position, all three of your resonance structures are equally stabilized due to resonance. If none of them have that tertiary carbon half. Yeah. So that means. So if it's just a benzene or a uh, methyl group, um, toluene can be nitrated 25 times faster than benzene. So this is why it's trinitrotoluene and not trinitrobenzene. It's because we'll find out that nitro groups are electron withdrawing, which means they, every time you add a nitro group, it slows things down. So you have to start from something that has a very strong activating group on it in order to be able to make those to add more than one nitration in a row, you have to have an activating group. Um, and our activating groups are always going to be, I have to be careful to using absolutes because there is an exception in there. We'll look at the table in a second. Um, most activating groups are electron donated. And it also means that we get stereoselectivity. We get a tiny amount of the meta product, much higher amounts of ortho and para. And almost in that two to one ratio that we would expect just from the fact that there are two ortho carbons, only one para carbon, it's a little bit, it doesn't favor that entirely, probably mainly due to sterics. You got a you know, a methyl group is not that large, but it's larger than a hydrogen. And so that's going to sort of um, just add a little bit of a steric hindrance. So you don't get quite a two to one ratio. It's almost a two to one ratio. And if it was, if we're doing this with T butyl benzene, we would expect that ratio to start favoring the pair up even more because the larger the group you put there, the more you're going to favor adding in a spot that's not sterically different. All right, so here is a meter drawing of all three possibilities. So if we have the nitration happening in the ortho position, we get a favorable resonance structure. If it's in the meta position, there is no way that we could put the positive charge on a tertiary carbon. In a para position, though, we can. Right? So they call this an ortho para director. If it's an ortho para director, that just means that your substituent is such that it's only going to really allow ortho and para products. Um, and we can actually see this if we, if we look at the electron or the effects on the um, potential energy. If we look at potential energy surfaces here, ortho and para are but both much lower, um, lower energy intermediates. And so you have a lower transition state barrier. The para is going to be the lowest because it doesn't have those sterics, but there's only one carbon that gives you the para attack. And so with that in mind, ortho is actually a major product, but really we get such 
significant amounts of both of them that we would be writing even if it says write the major product, you would want to write ortho product and the para product for the most part. If it's a if it's a multiple choice question and you have to pick one, then it gets a little bit hazy depending on how big that R group is. You kind of have to use your judgment a little bit um, if you don't have it memorized. All right, so anything that's an activator. Is going to be an, also going to be an ortho para director. So in that, so anything with a lone pair, so R groups are activators, but they're weakly activating, which tells you something about how strongly strongly activating groups are, because our weakly activating methyl group increased the reactivity the reaction rate twenty five times. Um, so our smarter and our strong activators are really fast. And so that's when you can have those runaway nitration reactions. If you have a strongly activating group and you're trying to nitrate it and you're not being careful, you can wind up with a whole bunch of nitration happening. And nitro groups on a benzene ring are really unstable because they will basically almost spontaneously rearrange to produce a whole bunch of oxygen gas and nitrogen gas. And it's an exothermic reaction. So exothermic gas byproducts, you know, we have a name for that. It's, it's an explosion. Right. So and I'm adding this caveat here. So anything with a lone pair that's in the second row. Is going to be a strong activator. Moderate activators still have that lone pair, but if you have other things attached to that lone pair, then that kind of limits how how much electron density they can give. And then our weak electron donating groups um, have no resonance that they can donate. These other ones with the lone pair, not only do you get a chance to make a, a tertiary carbocation. You actually wind up with a resonance structure where you actually have one of those lone pairs as one of your resonance structures. So you actually get extra resonance structure if you in your sigma complex if it's if you've got a lone pair there. We don't see that with um, bromine and chlorine though. They have a lone pair, but because they're not in the second row of the periodic table, they can't donate electron density as well. Uh, fluorine, because it's fluorine, is going to be an exception and it's not typically used. So I don't actually know. It's, it's in that gray area where I would want to look it up before I give you a solid answer on that one. So, but we, we can say halogens are deactivating groups because they're electron withdrawing, but they're still ortho para directors because they can make a resonance structure. That, that looks like it, a um, double bond. It's not going to be very stable, but there is a resonance structure, so you do get that extra stabilization. So they they are deactivated groups, but still ortho para directors. So deactivator just means it slows it down. The ortho para director means we still have that same logic up. It's going to go either in the O or in the P position. And I know I'm going fast on this, but I want you to have seen it all at once, and then we'll get more practice with it over the weekend and on and on uh, Tuesday. If you have an electron withdrawing group that has a conjugated double bond, that means your resonance structures are actually going to be pulling electron density away from the benzene ring instead of giving electron density to the ring. And so they are deactivating groups; they slow things down. And the sigma complex is going to look different too, right? Because if you have an electron withdrawing group on the ring already, not only is it going to slow things down, but an ortho attack 
is going to put a positive charge right next to an electron withdrawing group. So instead of getting extra stabilization, it actually gets destabilized when that happens. So basically, putting in a nitro group in the ortho position to an electron withdrawing group is not only is it not stabilized, does it not get that extra stabilization, it actually has extra destabilization. So we have the opposite thing happening, which makes sense. This electron withdrawing versus donating, right? It should be opposite. And so it's not that the meta position somehow is more stabilized. It's the meta position is still our baseline because it allows us to never put the positive charge on the substituents. But it avoids the extra destabilization. So I go back here. When there's an electron withdrawing group, the ortho and the para position both lower the activation energy and sped things up. When it's electron withdrawing group, the meta position still stays the same. But the ortho and the para position get less stabilized. So meta has no change from where it was effectively. Ortho and para both are higher in energy. All right, so electron donating, ortho para directors, and activating. Electron withdrawing is going to be a meta director in deactivating because we're pulling electron density away from the part where the electrophile is trying to attack. Right, and so this is the, the chart that's most useful when you're learning, when you're learning this. Um, because it has a list of all the different activators and deactivators. I mean, it's not a comprehensive list, but it's a pretty strong list. Um, whether they're strong, weak, or moderate activators, and whether they're OP directors or if they're meta directors. Right? So this is that gray area. But I didn't want to answer your question about fluorine because it's not on the list, so I don't actually know. And it is in that gray area where I've would hesitate to make a generalization. So the halogens are deactivators, but because they have those lone pairs, they're still OP directors. Everything else follows our general rules. If it's an activator, it means that it's electron donating, and it's, you're going to put your new substituent in the O or the P position. If it's a deactivator, and the easiest way to see that is if you've got conjugated pi bonds, then it's going to be a meta director. So with our two minutes left, Which of the following will react faster than benzene? So benzene's our baseline. So anything that's a activator will go faster than benzene. Anything that's a deactivator is slower than benzene. And where would we put the sulfonation product? So I'm in red, I'm gonna circle the deactivating groups. That bromine one is a weakly deactivating, but it still has the lone pair. And so we would be putting a sulfur group on for the left and for deactivating groups. We're putting our 
sulfonation product is going to go to the meta position two carbons away. The others, so this is an activating group, so that one will be faster than benzene. And if we sulfonate it, it'll go in the ortho or the para position. And because of how big this group is, the para position is likely bigger. Just be by sterics, but really you're going to get a pretty good mixture of the ortho and the para products. And bromobenzene is less reactive but it's still an ortho para director. Again, bromine is big, so probably sterics would favor the para position, but you'll get a mixture of both of those. This is your friend. Use this on the quiz. Like I said, I know we went fast, and to get feeling confident about it, We'll spend more time on this, but we just did one and a half lectures in, in one lecture space. So you're actually set up really nicely for the quiz this weekend, and we're almost back on the schedule from missing last Thursday. And if you do need to see this again, 